Welcome to the Synthesis of Yoga, the book that changed my life. We are now on the fifth chapter, last chapter and 28th episode and we will be starting with paragraph number 9. In our previous episode, we saw that the picture Sri Aurobindo gave was he is saying we must start with the vision of nature, a right understanding of nature. And he brought in this two perspectives, lower nature and higher nature. Even though nature is one for practical purposes to see there are these two movements, lower nature and higher nature. Both are integral. An integral means any part moving affects the whole and the whole is affecting the part. Everything is deeply interwoven into each other. And both lower nature and higher nature movements are integral. The difference is the lower nature moves in ignorance, in division, in separation resulting in ego, a limited bound ego. That is the movement of lower nature. In the higher nature, it moves in knowledge, in unity, transcending limitations and arriving at life divine. So these are the two movements of nature and the difference between a yogin and an ordinary person is that the normal person lives in the lower nature, bound by the limitations of the ego, ignorance and sense of separation. Whereas the yogin lives in the higher nature, where the movement is of oneness, transcending limitations and divine consciousness. Transition from lower to the higher nature is the journey of yoga and it can be done in two ways. One is by rejecting the lower nature and ascending to the higher nature. The other is on one hand ascension into the higher nature. Second movement is bringing that into the lower nature and transform it and elevate it to its divine possibilities. And if it is only an ascension, then synthesis is not necessary. Synthesis is necessary when the transformation is attempted. So that's what we saw in our previous episode. Now we take up the paragraph number nine. You will find the link to the chapter in the description. Please follow the text so that we can travel together and enjoy his vision, his teachings, his way of writing and expressing with minute details. The method we have to pursue then is to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine and to call him in to transform our entire being into his. So that is the essential idea that is to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine and to call him to transform our entire being into his. So that's the idea that we need to hold within our consciousness and first movement is to call upon the higher and to transform the lower by the very uh, force of the higher. So to put the whole conscious being into relation and contact, relation and contact. Normally we do not have that relation because our ego 
is turned outward and dispersed in the outer activities and we don't perceive the world and its activities as the divine we see it as the mundane difficult world in a messy situation and from there we need to shift our perspective as Sri Aurobindo mentioned in the previous episode we have to look at nature as the divine fulfilling through the creative force of the divine manifesting the world divine fulfilling himself in the material manifest world that is what the nature is so when we look at the nature that is the perspective with which we need to look at the nature and it is from that poise putting ourselves in contact with the divine and call upon the divine to transform our nature our human nature into its divine possibility so the method we have to pursue then is to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine and to call him to transform our entire being entire being into his so here it is a psycho spiritual method it is not a mechanical method movement is in our consciousness it is our conscious relationship with the divine and this cannot be a mechanical process though taking care of the bodily health all that can be done in a more or less mechanical way and methods coming in contact with the higher consciousness with the divine consciousness that is a conscious relationship that's a conscious effort it is a inner movement to reach out therefore it naturally become very intuitive very direct connection it's not an indirect connection where you are doing your mechanical practices of asana pranayama all that which mechanically put you in touch these methods are preparing purifying the body so that they are ready but if the inner movement is not there to contact the divine even in our meditation if the inner movement is not there to contact the divine consciousness then we remain on the surface so sri arbindo is going straight to the core of all the movements of all the practices you strip out all the details you go to the core of it the core of it is this the contact the yearning of the soul to contact the divine that is the central movement so that establishes the contact and call the divine to transform our lower nature so this is a very conscious relationship that we are building with the divine leading towards the transformation and the force the shakti of the divine would take up the transformation and it is not our individual limited effort that will lead to our effort is to contact the rest is taken up by the divine and his shakti so the method we have to pursue then is to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine and to call him in to transform our entire being into his so it is not so much rituals kriyas all that are useful at a preparatory level but the real movement required is the inner contact a direct calling and then the divine shakti would lead thus in a sense god himself the real person in us becomes the sadhaka of the sadhana 
Sadhana is the spiritual transformation practice. Sadhaka is one who is applying the sadhana, doing the sadhana. So in integral yoga, initially it is the sadhak who is the practitioners who is reaching out to the divine. But as the contact gets established more and more, and the more you recognize the divine presence everywhere in the universe and inside you in all the movements, then you realize it is God himself, the real person in us, becomes the sadhaka of the sadhana. Really, the sadhana is done by the divine through us as well as the master of the yoga, by whom the lower personality is used as the center of a divine transfiguration and the instrument of its own perfection. So there is Lord of yoga, the master of yoga, towards whom all the efforts are directed. So the divine is at once the master of the yoga as well as the sadhak, the sadhak who is doing the sadhana. So the divine pours into the sadhak, the practitioner, and takes up the work. And that's where you surrender more and more to the divine force, the divine shakti doing the sadhana through the instrumentation. And the instrument becomes the center of action for the divine consciousness, one of the centers of action in the world. And through that, it is also perfecting the instrument towards its divine perfection. Thus, in a sense, God himself, the real person in us, our inmost depth has the divine dwelling within us who is the real person. There is an outer personality of the ego. Deep within us, there is the real person who is the divine. Thus, in a sense, God himself is, him, in a sense, God himself, the real person in us, becomes the sadhaka of the sadhana, as well as the master of the yoga by whom the lower personality is used as the center of a divine transfiguration and the instrument of its own perfection. In effect, the pressure of the tapas, the force of consciousness in us, dwelling in the idea of the divine nature, upon that which we are in our entirety, produces its own realization. So this is the core process, tapas. But tapas dwelling on the idea of the higher nature, the divine nature, the divine movement, integral movement of the divine nature, the shakti, her movement. So, in effect, the pressure of the tapas. So, tapas is that the force of consciousness in us dwelling in the idea, capital I, idea of the divine nature. So, when our consciousness is dwelling on this idea, that is where the cooking, the heating happens. The, very dwelling on that idea and the idea has its inevitability of realization. Upon that which we are in our entirety, that is, we are essentially one with the divine nature, but we are unaware of it. We live in our separative ego consciousness, enmeshed in the lower nature. So we we have forgotten that we are of this higher nature. Though there is an internal kernel that is there holding it. So to first is consciously acknowledging that divine nature, that is our fundamental essential truth. 
to the idea of the divine nature upon which we are in our entirety produces its own realization. So the very tapas of this dwelling on this idea produces its own realization. It is not the mechanical methods but the very dwelling of consciousness on this fundamental idea of the divine nature that produces the result which is our transformation. The divine and all-knowing and all-effecting descends upon the limited and obscure descends upon the limited and obscure. Limited and obscure is the lower nature. That's where we are entangled. So when we dwell on the higher nature, the very idea of the divine perfection and that integral movement of the divine consciousness, that descends into this limited lower nature. That very descending movement upon the limited and obscure progressively illumines and energizes the whole lower nature. So this descending movement is progressive and it progressively illumines, it brings its light and energizes, it brings its energy. The whole na lower nature gets energized and illumined by the higher nature. And that reception is a direct response to our seeking that. That is done by dwelling on the higher nature. The very idea of the divine consciousness, the fundamental truth of our being. When you dwell on that truth, when we have that tapas of consciousness upon that central idea, then the higher nature, the divine shakti and her light, the divine pours the light and energy into the obscure, into the limited lower nature and substitutes its own action for all the terms of the inferior human light and mortal activity. So we are operating within the limited human light and mortal activity. Human light, which is our limited mental knowledge and our limited mortal activity. Mortal is death-bound activity. So our bodily life is bound by death and lives within the operations of the lower nature with its limited light with its limited activity. And when the higher nature, the divine consciousness pours its light and energy into it, it substitutes the lower movements with the higher. The very substitution leads to transformation. The divine and all-knowing and all-effecting, all-knowing and all-effecting, omniscient and omnipotent. The divine and all-knowing and all-effecting descends upon the limited and obscure, progressively illumines and energizes the whole lower nature and substitutes its own action for all the terms of the inferior human light and activity. That is how the transformation takes place. There is this contacting the higher nature, the divine consciousness, done by the tapas, dwelling on the idea of the right view of nature. Nature is nothing but the divine in manifestation. And there is an integral movement moving towards greater and greater union oneness and transcending the limitations, moving towards divine consciousness. When we hold that idea, not the idea of division, of limitation, of the ego, 
Instead of that, when we replace our contemplation, our dwelling of consciousness upon the idea of oneness, growing union, growing transcendence towards divine life, once we hold that as right at the heart of the sadhana, this is the central movement of the sadhana, it produces its result by bringing the divine response that pours its light and energy into the lower nature and substitutes all the movements that are, that are of our normal human, mental, vital, physical operations substitutes progressively, illumines progressively and transforms the lower nature. This is the process and it is direct process without utilizing, without having to rely, depend on any outer mechanical methods. It's a direct psycho-spiritual method of transformation. In psychological fact, this method translates itself into the progressive surrender of the ego with its whole field and all its apparatus to the beyond ego with its vast and incalculable but always inevitable workings. So from a psychological point of view, the transition is from the ego to that which is beyond ego. The higher nature in her universal divine dimension and the transcendent divine consciousness that is above, they all transcend our tiny little ego formation. Psychologically, what we experience as a separate person is our limited ego. Whether it says this me, the one who is the doer of all the action, the one who is in charge, these are the illusions of the ego. And ego can also be very negative. This little small me who can't do anything. I am so weak. I am so poor. I am so incapable. That too is same ego. On the other side, ego can say, I am the doer, I am the capable one, I am the one who will make everything happen. That too is ego. So both these forms of ego, this little separate, tiny little self with its apparatus, its thinking, its imagination, its memory, all are limited. Its emotions, its bodily power, its nervous impulses and reactions and its limited energy. Everything is very limited. It's a very narrow limited apparatus when we compare it with the universal nature. So it has its limited apparatus, limited possibilities. So this is the ego living in its normal consciousness. And this we have to go from the ego to that which is beyond ego. So in order to go, we need that conception of that which is beyond ego. The higher nature, the divine Shakti or the divine consciousness. It is when we hold that conception, the transition happens. So psychologically, the shift is from the ego to that which is beyond ego. And when we hold that consciousness or rather, when we dwell in our consciousness on this idea, then the higher nature begins to pour in and its movements are incalculable. For ego, ego is calculating, it is counting everything, measuring everything, calculating everything. And if you can measure and calculate, ego feels I am in control. If I cannot measure and count, then I don't know what to do. At the same time, 
Sri Aurobindo is revealing here, the movements of higher nature is incalculable, but always inevitable. Its workings are inevitable towards the result it is already intending in humanity through evolution. So, dwelling on the idea of that higher nature produces its inevitable result in incalculable ways that is beyond the ego to comprehend. In psychological fact, this method translates itself into the progressive surrender of the ego. Progressive surrender. You cannot surrender in one go. There is a progressive surrender. And ego has its many layers. So we need to surrender layer by layer. The progressive surrender of the ego with its whole field and all its apparatuses. So the ego is operating in, a, in its normal field of life, everyday life context. There is a family context, there is a workplace context, there is a social life context, the world context. So it, that is the field in which the ego is operating with its limited apparatus. So the progressive surrender of the ego with its whole field and its apparatus to the beyond ego with its vast and incalculable but always inevitable workings. It is inevitable. The higher nature's movement towards higher realization, that is inevitable. Certainly, this is no shortcut or easy sadhana. So, simple straight statement. This is no shortcut or easy sadhana. It requires a colossal faith, an absolute courage, and above all, an unflinching patience. These are three fundamental requirements, qualities, faith. That's the first one. Not a mild, meek faith, but a colossal faith. Powerful, deep, unshakable faith. Faith in the divine. That is the starting point. There is a higher consciousness. There is a greater wisdom. There is a divine consciousness. There is the divine Shakti. Whatsoever be the way you conceive the nature. Give your own vocabulary. doesn't matter. But to see that the manifest world is the progressive realization of the divine consciousness. And there is a higher nature working in it. An integral movement of higher nature moving towards more and more union, oneness, and life divine. Holding that, and this exists, and it is there, and that my true self, my deepest truth is that. And to have absolute faith in that vision, and holding that as an indwelling idea, tapas on that. So there is this colossal faith. Second is an absolute courage. So we need courage. An absolute courage. Unshakable courage without any trace of doubt that this is inevitable. This evolutionary transformation of individual and collective evolution towards the divine possibility, it is inevitable. Because it is not we who are doing it. It is the nature's own intention. We are tuning into it. We are dwelling on that idea. 
the higher nature, the divine Shakti is working through all towards its divine realization. And therefore, to have that absolute courage, if you feel you are small and weak, you will not have courage. But courage will pour into you and make you courageous when you have the faith in the divine. So an absolute faith leads to an absolute courage. A colossal faith leads to an absolute courage. That's the second quality. And above all, an unflinching patience. Patience, patience, patience. Because the transformation of the lower nature is a slow process. Knowledge can come in a flash. We can experience in aha moments, illumination. A profound experience reveals the deepest truth. But that doesn't mean our lower nature has transformed. And that transformation requires its own sweet time. As foreseen by the divine consciousness, depending upon the degree of limitations and obscurities of the lower nature in the individual. So one needs an unflinching patience. Patience that doesn't flicker, that doesn't weaken. So an unflinching patience. So these are three requirements on the path. Colossal faith, absolute courage, unflinching patience. You see, all these are psychological qualities required. If you think you don't have it, look into yourself with the very clear discerning eyes and see the divine dwells in you. It is the divine who brings these qualities into you. Having faith in the divine, that is the starting point. From there, everything else comes. It requires a colossal faith, an absolute courage, and above all, an unflinching patience. For it implies three stages of which only the last can be wholly blissful or rapid. So now Sri Aurobindo is breaking down the transformational journey, the yogic process into three stages. It implies three stages of which only the last can be wholly and blissful or rapid holy, blissful or rapid. So in three stages, the last one can be blissful and rapid. First two are bound to be slow and not necessarily very blissful. So the first, the attempt of the ego to enter into contact with the divine. So that is the very first stage. Ego lives in ignorance and it has no idea of the divine. Even when the search of the seeker begins, you don't know that you're searching for the divine. All that you know is you are like a fish out of water. You're thirsty for something. What is that something? You don't know. You may say, I am searching for myself. Who am I? And we try to define what we are seeking in many different ways. You say, I want a better world and I want beauty and harmony in the world. I want perfection in the world or in myself. I want to go into greater and greater freedom. But all this freedom, perfection, beauty, harmony, delight, all these are essential qualities of the divine. And Divine is a living present permeating all things. As in the Isha Vasya Upanishad, 
ईशा वास्यमिदम सर्वम यद किंच जगत्याम जगत दिस होल यूनिवर्स इज परमिएटेड बाय द डिवाइन इवन द टाइनिएस्ट ऑफ पार्टिकल्स व्हिच दिस इज नॉट व्हाट वी आर सीकिंग इन आवर एर्ली स्टेजेस ईगो lives in its forgetfulness its self centeredness in the initial stage what ego seeks is its own glory i want to be a yogi a great yogi i want to have this siddhi or that siddhi this is how the ego step into the path it gets attracted by some or other aspects like this particularly to become a guru a teacher become famous guru have disciples all kinds of ego bound ambitions everything can hide within the framework of the ego that's why that phase even to contact the divine it takes time because in the very beginning one is not aware of the divine guidance even though it was always there just that the ego is yet to recognize it it is in corresponding contact with the divine you, the more you see the divine grace acting in your life ego begins to surrender oh it is you who uh, who had been guiding me who had been leading me who had been changing me little by little it is not my effort my struggle my cleverness my smartness that is making the difference it is you who are making the difference and you may not even have a word to describe the divine name of the divine so initially it is this blind search for something that is unknown then you begins to eventually name it some people say nature some will say universe will provide some would say god will provide what sort be the way even you may say the emptiness is that absolute that will provide the grace that is what will change it doesn't matter by what name you are seeking the divine essentially you are seeking the divine so the earlier you recognize that you are seeking the divine better it is for the ego to contact because then your focus become very clear focus goes beyond me, i me and myself my need for siddhis my need for happiness my need for joy yes all that will come joy will come harmony will come siddhis may reveal themselves but that is not what we are seeking we are seeking the divine so that's a first stage the attempt of the ego to enter into contact with the divine the second stage the wide full and therefore laborious preparation of the whole lower nature by the divine working to receive and become the higher nature so that's a phase 2 so as we put effort to contact the divine then the light and energy of the divine begins to pour into the narrow limited ego bound instrumentation and gradually breaks the boundaries and make it wide open up and and there is a laborious process of preparation purification because our entire lower nature is entangled mixed up confused so the divine consciousness has to progressively refine it purify it and widen it the wider you become the more you are able to receive greater influx into the instrumentation whether you are receiving into the mind as knowledge whether you are receiving into the heart as emotions or you are receiving into the energy as the will to act in the world or into the body as it's the perfection health and beauty of the body all that 
pours into and there is a laborious preparation of the instrumental layers preparation of the mind preparation of the vital preparation of the physical instrumentation so the wide full and therefore laborious preparation of the whole lower nature by the divine working to receive and become the higher nature so that is the second stage receiving preparing a full preparation very time consuming preparation now the third and the eventual transformation that eventual transformation he doesn't go into the details of it at this point of time but that can be more blissful and rapid the first two stages can be very slow and laborious and we need faith colossal faith an absolute courage and unflinching patience to go through these phases and the greater the contact more well establish the contact with the divine deeper your settling and surrender to the divine consciousness gradually all those divine qualities will begin to manifest in you whether it is of harmony of freedom of joy everything begins to manifest because the divine consciousness is of that nature satchidananda blissfully conscious existence pouring itself into the limited mold and expanding its limits and transforming the layers of instrumentation and the, that third stage of transformation can be beautiful rapid enjoyable tremendously blissful it makes the blind to see and the lame to stride over the hills here this line is actually from the gita he is quoting from the gita in sanskrit it goes something like this mukam karoti vachalam pangum langayate girim the original line is the one who is dumb will speak eloquently and the lame the one who cannot walk properly will climb the mountains here using the word makes the blind to see and the lame to stride over the hills a slight variant so it makes the blind to see and the lame to stride over the hills mukam karoti vachalam pangum langayate kirim yat kripa tamaham vande paramananda madhava that is the original line from the gita that is the divine grace the who is the supreme beloved full of delight paramananda supreme delight of madhava divine is na- called as madhava the intellect becomes aware of a law capital l law this is the law of the divine the intellect become aware of a law that beneficently insists and a succor that upholds so there is a motherly beneficently insistence and the support that upholds even when we stumble and fall the support is always there initially we don't realize this is happening the support is given we may be in despair lost searching crying for direction but the support is always there in fact that support can pour into you the more you are recognizing the presence that is guiding the intellect becomes aware of a law that beneficently insists and a succor that upholds the heart speaks of a master of all things the heart is recognizing a master of all things 
and friend of man. Sakha, Sri Krishna was called by Arjuna as Sakha. Before Arjuna realized who Sri Krishna was, Arjuna was calling him friend. Sakha, he treated Krishna as a friend and indeed Krishna was his best friend. Divine would come to you as best friend. Sakha, friend of man or a universal mother. That is the most preferred form in integral yoga to see as the universal mother who is nourishing, protecting, guiding, leading all towards the divine perfection. So whether you conceive as the divine mother or as a friend or as a master, this is the key. We need to consciously acknowledge and that happens gradually and slowly. Initially, intellect has no idea, but you begin to notice random coincidences leading you gently, a kind of intelligence that is leading you gently. You may say the universe will send this or that. There is a synchronicity growing in your life. Behind all that, there is a wisdom that is leading. So the more the intellect is able to recognize that guiding wisdom, mother's presence growing in your life, better it is. So the intellect becomes aware of a law that beneficently insists. There is an insistence by the divine consciousness to take certain steps in life. And the succor that upholds the heart speaks of a master of all things and friend of man or a universal mother who upholds through all stumblings. No matter how much we stumble, this support is there. Always. And we need to have that faith, colossal faith in that divine support, grace, protection and an absolute courage to follow the path and unflinching patience, regardless of all the stumblings. Therefore, this path is at once the most difficult imaginable. And yet, in comparison with the magnitude of its effort and object, the most easy and sure of all because the divine is directly helping and the effort required to come in contact with the divine is in fact much simple, much less. Just that your heart has to recognize the presence, grow in love for the divine and then it becomes the most enjoyable, most easy compared to the result it brings, the whole transformation that it brings. The mental transformation, vital transformation, physical transformation, all that it brings compared to that result, the effort is relatively small because the grace enters and brings the transformation. It is not our own effort. In various Kriyas and Tantric processes and Hatha Yogic methods, it is the human will that is struggling and doing the doer in an elaborate ceremonious way. Spending hours and hours purely in the rituals and Kriyas and processes. Here it becomes a direct contact with the Divine. And heart's longing for the Divine brings the response of the Divine. And that makes the path easy easier than any path. Therefore, this path is at once the most difficult imaginable and yet in comparison with the magnitude of its effort and object, the most easy and sure of all. So that's a great promise and great truth actually. It takes really long time to recognize the divine. Personally, it took me a long time to recognize it is 
that grace and presence that is actually guiding and leading and even doing your sadhana. And surrendering to that consciously and the very joy of surrender, that's when the path becomes more and more joyful, effortless, easy and flowing. And your transformation, it is not you who are transforming yourself, it is that which is pouring in its light and energy and taking up every little corner and illuminating, transforming, bringing out that which is to be transformed and making you free, wide and liberated, not in any other world, but here in this world. And that's where the progress becomes increasingly joyful. The first stage is of ego contacting the divine, the effort of the ego contacting the divine, which takes its time. Second stage is that elaborate preparation of the whole being with all its layers and making it wide by the inpouring of the divine consciousness into the instrumental nature. And the third stage is the eventual transformation, which can be blissful, joyful. So with that, we come to the end of this episode. Please do share your insights, your personal journey that can be of value to others. You may think that your experiences of how you came to your path, all that may not be of interest. But trust me, it is in our sharing of how we, figuring, how we are figuring things out when we share, it become a ripple that spreads more and more people get inspired. So I invite you to share your insights of how your own, the random even synchronicity that is growing, eventually leading you towards the path and you become increasingly aware of a greater wisdom that is guiding you and something else leading you and transforming you. You're recognizing that you're only an instrumentation. That would be lovely to know. Please do share. And uh, those who have not yet subscribed, please click on the bell button below so that you get notification. And see you next week. Thank you.